Writer, engineer, and futurist Sir Arthur C. Clarke has studied the controversy for years. So, like everyone else, I was very excited when the so-called coal fusion announcement was made. And then, again, like everybody else, I became disappointed and forgot about the whole thing when it seemed to be a mistake. Though I was rather puzzled why two world-class scientists couldn't make such fools of themselves. Well, during the years that followed, slowly from time to time there came news of other laboratories repeating the experiment and getting positive results. And there's been a sort of groundswell all over the whole world of new information. And during the course of the last five years or so, I've slowly become convinced from my original skepticism to 99% uh, certainty that it is for real. The evidence now is really overwhelming. If major government labs and universities around the world are publishing volumes of data that report the existence of excess heat and nuclear products, why is there still a debate? Why do many influential skeptics still insist that neither fusion nor anything out of the ordinary is going on? If you're doing an experiment, it should be reproducible. You should be able to, if you put in the same things in, you should get the same thing out every time. Douglas Morrison of the High Energy Physics Laboratory, CERN. Despite nine years of work, nothing is reproducible. They cannot consistently get the same result every time. And uh, this is a major problem. It means you don't understand, you're not getting things, and it raises suspicion that probably you're making some mistake. You have little fluctuations, and if you get a big fluctuation, you save in effect, and a small fluctuation, you save nothing. Because people typically might do 20 experiments and get two or three, they find something. Which suggests that you're working just in sort of noise, the background noise, there's nothing actually there. This is, a very is the signal to noise ratio of the measurement strong enough so that scientists can be absolutely certain there has been no mistake? That they are actually measuring excess heat? Cold fusion scientists long ago put the issue of measurement accuracy to rest. Like good scientists, they tried to prove themselves wrong. Still, the excess heat findings persist. Since 1848, it has been known that a certain amount of heat is required to change the temperature of a given amount of water. At premier labs such as SRI International, Dr. Michael McCubrey has determined that the effect is neither fleeting nor difficult to measure. The cold fusion cell is enclosed in a calorimeter, which has thermocouples at various key points to read the temperature. The experiment looks extremely complex on the surface, but fundamentally, it is simple. An ordinary coffee maker provides an analogy. Cold water goes in, hot water comes out. The temperature of the water is read before the electrical input is supplied, and then again as it rises. Some of the heat is lost during the process, but the result is obvious. McCubrey's calorimeter works in a similar way, but with an accuracy of one one-thousandth of a degree. The cooling water flows in a steady stream and passes the inlet thermocouple, which measures the temperature. It swirls around the cell, cooling it down and carrying off the heat. When it exits, the outlet thermocouple measures the temperature again. Inlet temperature is subtracted from outlet temperature to determine how hot the water has become during its passage. Meanwhile, input electricity to the cell is monitored. During an experiment with a palladium cathode for the first week, while the cathode is loading, no excess is detected. Later, in a successful test, the outlet water temperature climbs and total output energy from the cell exceeds input. This is called excess energy. Excess heat is measured at least 30 times higher than the background noise, often much higher. Remarkably, the supposedly negative results on excess heat, which critics often cite from the early days of cold fusion, have been found to be highly flawed. A case in point, Upon re-examination of the original raw data from the 1989 experiments at MIT, there appeared startling discrepancies in the published results. The raw data graph here shows excess heat well above the baseline. 
but in MIT's official publication, the graph shows temperatures hovering around the baseline, suggesting no excess heat. Engineer Dr. Eugene Mallet, a science journalist at MIT at the time, resigned in protest. In the case of MIT, it was a disaster. These people, before even analyzing their calorimetry data, held a party for the death of cold fusion. And then they, unfortunately, fudged the data, manipulated the data, to make a positive result look negative. At the very least, the people at MIT had an obligation to go back and check their experiment again. Their results don't prove cold fusion, but they certainly had a positive result. Professor George Miley, director of the Fusion Studies Laboratory at the University of Illinois, was one of the few editors of a peer-reviewed physics journal to accept papers on cold fusion. Positive measurements of helium, uh, continued reports of heat burst, uh, uh, the tritium measurements that people have done, while they're not reproducible always, the fact that they occur keep, kept encouraging me. Let's take a tritium as an example, which is work that Tom Clater has done at Los Alamos. At uh, a meeting uh, about a year ago where he was presenting his material, I asked him what I thought was a key question. Have you convinced your management at Los Alamos that tritium is real? Because it seems like such a convincing case. And he said, no, I haven't. I said, why not? He said, well, the problem is that I only get a positive result three times out of ten. Now think about that. If it happens once, the inquisitive scientists should say, well, how did it happen? Let's find out how we can make it happen again and how we can ultimately make it happen consistently. The tritium work was the first indication to me that, that there was a reality. And then uh, Clater at Los Alamos also got positive results, and so did uh, Howard Menlove. And they're people that I respect and, and could talk to personally. I then wrote a uh, review of the field, looking at everybody's work worldwide, and talked to the many of the people that were involved in, in the work. And on the basis of, of that review and personal knowledge of my own work and other people's, it became fairly clear that there was a, a very strange phenomena occurring here. There is clearly evidence of anomalous excess heat which occur in these experiments under some rather difficult uh, to achieve conditions but rather well-defined conditions. There are also in similar experiments sometimes and rather dissimilar experiments sometimes evidence of an anomalous nuclear process and both uh, anomalies are worth uh, pursuing. It's my suspicion my uh, bias, if you like, that the two anomalies are in fact connected, that there's an underlying fundamental uh, mechanism which connects the two, I would be satisfied with an accurate description of the method by which the lattice, the palladium crystalline system with deuterium inside it, how that crystalline system interacts with the nuclear process. There is something new coming up. And so, like everybody, uh, uh, you know, professors who teach physics hate to change their courses. Huh? <laughs> and generally, they don't appreciate monsters which crop up and uh, which cannot be explained, explained within the frame of the present knowledge.